Imagine a scalar as just one number floating inside of a box. This value can change as you want, and the range of all possibilities is most often tracked by the real line. What about a vector? One of its representation, but not the only one, is an array of scalars, each inside of their own box, lined up in a specific order. Each box can be tracked by its own version of the real line, for example. Each number tells you how far to go in a certain direction. In three dimensions, for example, you'd find three numbers, and their respective real lines are usually called x, y, z. This is a vector, in this case, a one-dimensional array of numbers, and the number of entries depends on the dimension of the space you're in. Using the same sort of analogy, what is a matrix? It can be represented as a table. Each column corresponds to an input direction, and each row to an output direction. So it maps vectors in an n-dimensional space, Rn, to vectors in an m-dimensional space, Rm. And that's a matrix, an array of arrays. What happens if we continue to extend this idea to arrays of arrays of arrays of arrays and so on? Notice that the layers or the collections of arrays has nothing to do with the dimension of the space we're working in. For example, think about an array of arrays, so a matrix M, that maps three vectors to four vectors. This matrix maps a three-dimensional space into a four-dimensional space. However, it is an array of arrays. In other words, just two layers or collections of arrays involved here. It has nothing to do with the dimensions of the underlying spaces. This number of layers or collections of arrays is called the rank or order of a tensor. And by the way, all the mathematical objects that we've seen so far in this video are tensors. A vector is a tensor of rank 1, because there's only one array involved here. But a matrix is an array of arrays so it's a tensor of rank 2. A scalar is a weird array because it contains only one entry, so it's not really an array. It has zero layers or collections of arrays. That's why we say that it's a tensor of rank 0. There are also tensors with higher ranks, like a tensor with rank 3, which can be represented with a 3D cube of scalars. But again, it's just a representation. The rank of a tensor has nothing to do with the dimension of the space it lives in. It's too clumsy to draw here, but each of these entry boxes would have their own real lines sticking out of them as their range of possible values. Continuing with the same logic, a tensor of rank 4 can be seen as a four-dimensional cuboid. It's impossible to draw, but you get the idea. Actually, not all tensors of rank 3 eat three distinct vectors as shown here, and spits out a scalar. There are some tensors of rank 3 that eat vectors and spit out vectors too, or that eat and spit out covectors. These distinctions come from the concepts of covariant and contravariant basis. But before that, what's a covector anyway? Think of a vector as an arrow on the real plane with its standard coordinate basis i and j, for example. The covectors are right there, staring at you, but you can't see them because the basis is orthogonal. But what happens if we tilt the basis axes this way? Can we still describe the vector x as a linear combination of the elements of the basis? The answer is yes, but we have two options now, so a duality. Either we can decompose the vector x using dashed lines that are parallel to the basis axes, or using dashed lines that are perpendicular to the basis axes instead. Both representations are valid, but as you can see, its components are different. In the first representation, we choose to depict the components, which are just real numbers by the way, not vectors, with superscripts. In the second type of decomposition, we use subscripts instead. Actually, the second representation when written this way is wrong, because the unit vectors i and j are usually only used for the parallel projections. 
The question is, is there an alternative basis such that a linear combination of the elements of this new basis with perpendicular projections allows us to express the vector x? The answer is yes, and it's called the dual basis. Our original basis, defined by parallel projections, is usually denoted with e1 and e2, which are subscripts, such that the little hats indicate that these are unit vectors, so their lengths are 1, and it's called the contravariant basis. The vector components are x1 and x2, superscripts. I know it's kind of confusing, because the basis vectors e1 and e2 are written with indices down, but the components of the vector are denoted with the indices up. Don't worry about that yet. We'll talk a little bit about index notation and Einstein summation a little bit later in this video. For now, don't pay much attention to whether the indices are up or down. Just focus on distinguishing in your mind when we're dealing with a contravariant basis, opposed to the other type of basis, called covariant. Also, it's important to remember that these components, x1 and x2, are nothing but real numbers. Now, it's dual basis, defined by perpendicular projections on the original basis axis, can also represent the vector x by parallel projections on its own basis axis. These are denoted as e1 and e2 superscripts. This is called the covariant basis, and the vector components are real numbers denoted as x1 and x2 with subscripts. Any two bases, e1 and e2, subscripts, and e1 and e2 with superscripts, are dual with respect to each other. And this is so if they satisfy these conditions. ej dot product with ei results in the Kronecker delta, or the identity matrix. This means, for example, in three dimensions, that e1 subscript is orthogonal to e2 superscript, and also to e3 superscript but not to its counterpart e1 superscript. In other words, its own dual. The same is valid for e2 subscript. It is orthogonal to e1 superscript and to e3 superscript, but not to its own dual e2 superscript. And the same is also true for e3 subscript. If you are enjoying this video, please do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. These elements, e1, e2, e3 superscripts, in the dual basis are called covectors. When the basis is orthogonal, the dual basis coincides with the original basis. So the basis ej superscript can also produce or describe other covectors as well. If EI subscript is a basis for the vector space V, then EJ superscript is its dual basis for its dual space V star. Any covector omega in V star can be written as omega J, EJ, subscript and superscript, respectively, or simply as the sum omega 1, E1, plus omega 2, E2, and so on. Using a similar logic, we can talk about co-matrices, or actually covariant matrices. And this, of course, happening in a non-orthogonal coordinate system. And we can also extend it to tensors of higher ranks. We won't discuss them in detail here, but I'll tell you that. The core of tensor calculus lies exactly in understanding how geometric and physical quantities transform when the basis is non-orthogonal which is something that happens very often, especially when studying abstract curved spaces. Tensors provide the language to translate from contravariant to covariant basis, and vice versa. So basically, from the original to the dual basis, back and forth. And this is done by raising and lowering indices. A contravariant vector is written with an upper index. It transforms oppositely to the basis. This means that if you imagine a vector v as a physical arrow in space and change the coordinate basis, say you rotate the basis, axis, or stretch them, then the components vi superscript in the vector v will change, but the physical arrow stays the same. It's invariant in space. 
As you can see, contravariant vectors, like this one that we've just seen, are great to describe physical quantities, such as velocities, displacements, forces, and so on. Because these things are not supposed to change in general, just because you decided to use different measuring sticks. Or even the same ones as before, but with different angles. That's why you'll often hear physicists saying things like contravariant vectors are more natural. They correspond to how geometric quantities exist independently of the coordinates. So for example, say that the basis axis are scaled by a factor of two. Then the components v1 and v2 will be scaled inversely. In other words, by a factor of a half. So they transform opposite to the basis. This keeps the contravariant vector invariant. Great. But what about the basis covectors? In other words, the covariant basis vectors. Imagine you have a vector space with non-orthogonal basis EI subscript. Its dual basis has a basis EJ superscript. Since these bases are dual with respect to one another, by definition we have that their dot product results in the identity matrix, and that each vector is orthogonal to all the other covectors except for its own dual. Now, suppose that we change the contravariant basis with a rotation. The covectors in the dual basis can't just be unchanged, otherwise the condition for duality would not be satisfied. The new covariant basis still has to be orthogonal to the new contravariant basis, except for their own individual counterparts, of course. And that's why we say that the dual, so covariant basis, transforms along, so together, with the original, so contravariant basis, in order to maintain consistency. That's the goal of tensor calculus, to express invariant truths, even if the coordinate basis and the coordinate systems change. Therefore, Tijk, written this way, is a rank 3 tensor with one contravariant index and two covariant indices. The only problem is that now we have a tensor that is not purely contravariant nor purely covariant, but rather a mix of both. As a consequence, its explicit version in terms of basis vectors and covectors looks like this. Here, this symbol means tensor product, and it allows us to combine covariant with contravariant basis. At this point, maybe some of you are asking yourselves, what about a super duper general tensor? What does that look like? This that you are looking at is a rank PQ tensor where P and Q are natural numbers. Remember, you can think of the components of this tensor organized in a sort of P plus Q dimensional hypercube. Notice, for example, that in the case of a rank 1, 1 tensor, we write the first I as a superscript for its components and for the corresponding basis vectors as a subscript. The same up and down convention is used for J, this is not a coincidence, it is the famous Einstein summation convention. Every time you see the same index appearing twice, one of them up and the other down, it means that you should sum them. And the tensor is said to be contracted in this index. Yes, as you can see, writing this tensor explicitly results in a huge expression and that's why some people say that Einstein's greatest contribution to pure mathematics was his summation convention. Einstein went even further by informally referring to tensors simply using their components, Tij. This perspective became so intuitive and practical, especially in physics, that it influenced even pure mathematicians working with tensors. Unfortunately, we won't have time to see all the important things about tensors. But this is a list of the main concepts that anyone who's serious about learning tensor calculus should know. Okay, to conclude the video, we'll see some very useful examples of tensors that you've probably encountered in many different contexts. And if you've never seen them before, you might want to pay close attention because they show up really often in pure and applied areas of math. The metric tensor Gij. The type is rank 02.
It measures distances and angles on a manifold, like Riemannian metric tensors or pseudo-Riemannian ones, just like in general relativity. The second, the Riemann curvature tensor, RIJKL. The type is rank 1, 3. This tensor encodes intrinsic curvature of a manifold at each point. 3. The torsion tensor, TIJK. The type is rank 1, 2. This tensor measures how much twist happens when you try to move vectors around in space. In other words, it measures if moving from A to B results in a different direction compared to moving from B to A. In this case, the torsion tensor is not trivial. The Ricci tensor, Rij. The type is rank 0, 2. It's the contraction of the Riemann tensor on the first and third indices. As a consequence, it's purely covariant, and it encodes how volumes distort under curvature. Don't forget that we have a section on our website dedicated to research where you can submit your very own. Link in the description. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.